Um, I'm Louisa, most of you know me, and our guest today is Jeff Sparrow, uh, who is the author of, I asked him how many books, and he said he thought it might be 11. We're not sure. But on subjects as varied as killing, pornography, and crimes against nature, capitalism, and gold, global heating. Today, we're talking about his new book, Provocations, which is collected opinion writing. Um, and if you haven't come across Jeff yet, he teaches change in journalism, uh, advanced nonfiction, and thesis. So if you want to rush to sign up to his subjects after today. Or alternatively yeah. leave them. It's too late to do that. <laughs> They're stuck with you <laughs> with the census date yesterday. So um, what we're going to do is we're going to do about 20 minutes of Q&A, and then I'm going to open it uh, for questions from all of you. So think of your questions. Um, so I thought we'd just start at the beginning. I mean, how did you get into opinion writing? What was the first opinion piece you ever wrote? Yeah, so I never wanted any kind of journalistic career. I never studied journalism in any way. Um, I spent a long time as a political activist, more or less full time. And um, insofar as I've had any kind of writing career, it really came out of that. And so the, the first kind of, my first attempts to write um, opinion pieces were direct responses to particular issues that I was involved in agitating around. In fact, I think some of the very first ones was I was um, arrested and charged with um, a series of um, crimes. <laughs> <laughs> Introduction not, not, not coming students. out quite the way I wanted, but <laughs> I was involved in it, some demonstrations um, around um, around education when the, the Labor government was abolishing the free education in Australia, and as a result of that, we, me and a bunch of other people were facing a bunch of politically motivated charges, and I think some of the first pieces I wrote were around that, actually. There was a campaign to... Uh, to get them to drop the charges. And so naturally I had a, a direct and material interest in supporting this campaign. And um, I'd always, you know, I'd always been one of those people who could write a little bit, you know, done writing at school. And I thought, okay, well, I'll try and, you know, get some stuff up. And then I did. And then I thought, well, okay, this will be a useful thing if you're a political person to try and get, you know, your views into the media. And so that was kind of the impetus. It wasn't really from a kind of media perspective. It was much more from a sort of activist perspective. And did you get all the charges? What were the charges? Did you get them all dropped? Uh, we did, in fact. In fact, and the police had to apologise because um, uh, they were clearly sort of politically um, motivated. And they did. It was actually a really um, early and important lesson for me about the importance of um, collective organising to change public opinion because when the charges had first been levelled they seemed very serious and it did actually look like there were going to be very serious consequences. By the end of the pro prolonged um, drop the charges campaign, um, you know, uh, the, uh, the magistrate ended up castigating the police for bringing the charges in the first place and so it was all well that ended well. Good triumph over Eagle. So how did you change that experience into a career in writing? Well, see, it wasn't really a career. I mean, I guess that, I mean, I guess that's actually quite important. I'm sure a lot of people listening know it's very, very hard, increasingly hard to to make a career in journalism in um, in Australia, and particularly with things like opinion writing, where um, the pay is very small, the turnaround time is very quick, and um, one of the reasons I persisted with it was pre was precisely because I wasn't trying to do it as a career. Had it been a career option, it would have been a really bad career option. <laughs> but, you know, if you're motivated um, by particular sort of ideals or, or uh, particular perspectives that you're trying to get across, you're perhaps more inclined to persist, even though that there's no, you know, there aren't really career prospects in it or not very much in the way of career prospects. So let's, I mean, let's talk about your book, Provocations. Uh, the first piece in it is particularly interesting. It's about how the sugar industry in Queensland was basically 
meant that historically it was a slave state, even though slavery was um, technically illegal at the time. And it's just this sort of fascinating glance at a hidden portion of Australian history. It's also in the conversation. Everybody can look it up there and read it for free if you don't want to buy Jeff's book. <laughs> <laughs> Although I'm sure it's in the library. Um, and in the conversation, it's called How Blackbirding in Colonial Australia Created a Legacy of Racism. I mean, why don't you step us through that process, how you decided to write about that, how you did your research, um, yeah. how you wrote it? See, that's, that's why you can't make a career in, in writing, because <laughs> people advertise that you can, get, you can get material for free. So this is a piece that came out, people might remember, um, during the uh, Black Lives Matter campaign, some local supporters of Black Lives Matter were pushing to take down some statues of various colonialists across Australia. And the then Prime Minister Scott Morrison responded by saying, in fact, there had not been slavery in um, Australia. And there was something of a um, pushback around this. And it made it clear that lots of Australians were very, very uncertain about Australian history and knew very little about it. So the part of the, the initial impetus of writing the story was simply to bring out more about the reality of bonded labour in Australia and how fundamental it was to the development particularly of Northern Australia, Australia and particularly of Queensland. Um, as uh, Louise mentioned, if you go back and look at the newspapers at the time, it is astonishing how openly they are discussing slavery in Australia and how often people are talking about the prospect of a civil war breaking out in Australia and Queensland becoming separate from the rest of Australia as a slave state. Uh, Geoffrey Blaney, the historian, has actually got a... Um, uh, a, a, a discussion of this in one of his books where he says that, you know, had this movement for what was called northern separation gone ahead, there would have been a explicitly racially based state established in, um, in Queensland, something like South Africa or Rhodesia. So it's kind of an amazing story and it's even more amazing that people don't know it. But when I started writing about it, what is what makes the story even more fascinating is that Australia is simultaneously shaped by slavery, but it's also shaped by anti-slavery. And this is really important too. So when the first fleet leaves Britain, they leave in the same month as one of the first um, campaigning groups to abolish slavery in, in Britain is being set up. And um, one of the reasons that um, well, one of the reasons why it's necessary to set up a penal colony in Australia is because of the uh, American Revolution, which has really turned the British public against slavery. And then there's a whole bunch of slave rebellions, most notably in Haiti, which means that the British establishment are really, really concerned to move away from plantation slavery because they've realised it's not economically efficient and they're tremendously worried about slave rebellions. So they explicitly say um, that when Australia is settled, this is not going to be a slave state. And so Morrison was actually technically right about that. It's just that... The f what that meant in practice was that the theoretical opposition to chattel slavery of the form that persisted in the Caribbean, where one person could legally own another person, paradoxically legitimated other forms of bondage. So the anti-slavery activists in Britain were mostly quite conservative and religious, and they were very much focused on... Um, the idea of individual responsibility. So one of the reasons they were opposed to slavery is because slaves couldn't take individual responsibility for their action. So they simultaneously thought slavery was bad, but thought incredibly severe punishments on people who sinned were good. So you had this paradoxical situation where at the same time 
as the British authorities are saying, we're against slavery and we won't let Australia become a slave state. They are simultaneously packing people off in chains to make them work through bonded labour as convicts to build this new society. And this tension runs all the way through Australian history. So again and again they say we are not going to enslave Indigenous people and in fact they don't attempt to set up the kind of chattel slavery they have in the Caribbean. But at the same time, the, in practice, the way they, they treat Indigenous people um, recuperates all manner of different forms of um, bonded labour and sexual slavery that runs throughout Australian history. And this becomes really, really important for the sugar industry where sugar is worked by Pacific Islanders who are brought to Australia as indentured labourers. In theory, they are supposed to have signed contracts to come and work in Australia. In in practice, they were often um, more or less kidnapped and worked to death on the, um, on the cane fields. So, I mean, you have this whole interesting um, period of history. How do you go about writing that? Do you just read a ton of history books or do you interview people or what's your process? Yeah, 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 okay. Well, I'm very, always very concerned to try and intervene in particular debates. It seems to me that if you're, uh, if you're a political person and if you're writing stuff um, around opinion, what's really crucial is to try and find the arguments that are around at the time and try and present something which says something new. And in this case particular, what I was focused on was the Australian Constitution um, because of, you know, the debates around um, the voice and the alterations of the Australian Constitution. And most Australians, when they think of the Australian Constitution, think of the American Constitution instead which for, came out of the American Revolution, and so in some ways it's quite an inspiring document. The Australian Constitution did not come out of a revolution, but was in fact um, the product of horse trading between the various uh, state premiers, and it was fundamentally connected with this argument about slavery. So if you go back to the debates around the Australian Constitution, they are next level insanely racist just insanely racist. Again and again, you have all of the founding fathers of Australia, Edmund, Edmund um, Barton, the first Prime Minister, um, you know, all of the key figures just saying again and again, we do not believe in racial equality. The whole point of this country is to establish a land for the white race. And they say it again and again and again. And in fact, they use this rhetoric of anti-slavery to say Australia should be different from the United States because when the United States ended slavery, they allowed African Americans to stay in America. We're not going to make that mistake. We're going to deport all the Pacific Islanders. And so the two key acts of the new Federation of Australia are one, the White Australia Act, and two, the deportation of Pacific Islanders. And it's bizarre but also representative that most Australians know almost nothing about this because it's so fundamental to Australian history and it's so key to the debates about um, Federation. And that really didn't answer your question in the slightest. <laughs> no, it didn't. So do you want to talk about process? Uh, yeah, look, I don't think it's worth writing a piece unless you've got something different to say. And I don't think it's worth writing um, a piece until you, unless you feel that you can push the public debate in a certain direction. Otherwise, you know, it's not worth it for the money. Why, why do it? So for me, that's the key thing. Do I actually have something interesting to say? Is there something that's not being argued by someone else? And if so, then I will try and do it. So that, I guess you call it the sparrow magic. I mean, how do you apply that? Because you cover a huge range of topics in this book. You know, you've got a story about a turtle called Wilbur, about the return of the thylacine, the Tasmanian tiger, which is extinct, uh, Enid Blyton. I mean, how do you find the sparrow magic in each of these topics, which is so diverse? I mean, the good thing about doing this kind of writing is you can write about anything that interests you. You know, you... I... Uh, you know, I used to work as an editor, and what they say about editors is you don't know a lot about anything, but you know a little about a lot. And I think it's the same thing with this sort of writing, you know, that to write, you know, a thousand words about something, you don't necessarily have to have a great deal of knowledge. You, need, you just need to have a kind of curiosity 
and you know a, a willingness to, um, to 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 follow train of thoughts. And what's really great about it is it gives you an opportunity to do some of that stuff. You know, so you know. Um, the piece about the turtle was I, I, I pitched a feature to, to, to The Guardian about climate change and the hook for it was the life forms that live a long period of time. So um, there are turtles that are alive that you know, met Charles Darwin because they can live for hundreds of years. There are whales that are around 500, that are 500 or 600 years. There are trees that are 3,000 years old. Well, it's a kind of cool way of raising some of the issues connected with climate change, which is to do with geological time, simultaneously to do with geological time, deep time, but it's also increasingly to do with the fact that we are running out of time. So it kind of coheres around these questions of time. And then, it, you know, if you're meeting Wilbur, the, 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 the tortoise, I think it was, there is a difference between turtle and tortoises, but I can't remember what it is. It gives you a narrative, you know, damn tortoise tried to bite me at one stage. <laughs> <laughs> nearly put paid to him on the spot. <laughs> 200 years nearly came to an end. And um, at this point, I'd just like to say hi to everybody who's joined us online. And if you have any questions, please type them in the chat box. We will come to Q&A um, quite soon. Um, this point about pitching editors I mean, how do you go about that? Because I write a lot of opinion pieces too, and I invariably think I have an amazing idea. And if I pitch it, I often find the editors are much more interested in a much more basic and banal idea. Yeah. They, they, they often go, oh, no, that's not interesting. But what about this? And they say something which I think is completely boring and obvious, but I'll often write it anyway. Um, how do you go about deciding which ideas are worth writing about? I mean, it is difficult in Australia, I think, because, you know, there's a relatively small number of outlets compared to um, other countries. In fact, there's fewer outlets now than when I um, started. And I think the calibre of opinion writing in Australia is pretty low compared to, um, to other countries. And there is a sort of blandness that kind of prevails. However, um, if you are able to sort of establish your own kind of niche, um, even if it's a very narrow niche, you can get a reputation for, 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 for that, which I suppose I was fortunate enough to, you know, to be offered a contract as a columnist on The Guardian it, it, because it's a left-leaning publication, you know, like there was a certain space that I could kind of feel and I've, you know, I've established a certain, you know, a certain space there or um, whatever. But in terms of, you know, like students who are looking to pitch pieces, I mean, establishing relationships with editors is incredibly important and that is something which is to do with practice and perseverance as much as anything else, you know. Making those initial kind of cold calls is horrible. I mean, I still hate it, you know, and so once you've actually got sufficient relationship with an editor that they know who you are and that they will at least look at the things you send them, it's a, it's a lot easier. Yeah. And then they know you can deliver on time. I know you can deliver on time, that's always right. Always the key. Um, so you're talking about niche, and I was going to ask you about your political stance. I mean, your niche is basically being a socialist. <laughs> <laughs> and, I mean, I went to a talk that you gave the other day where you literally said, and I wrote it down... Right, Prime, down. Minister, Prime Minister Scott Morrison is someone you wouldn't piss on if he was on fire. <laughs> I mean, that kind of really explicit political stance, do you think it's good or bad for your career to have one? Oh, it's terrible. I mean, <laughs> it's terrible. I mean, particularly in a country like this, right? I mean, you know, like, so I'm a, I'm a socialist and I'm, you know, unavowed uh, about that. There are lots of other countries where um, socialists are a regular feature of the political landscape. I mean, Australia is particularly barren in that respect, and the political consensus in this country is so narrow that, you know, like, I do a lot of work for the pieces that I write and a lot of research and probably more so than people who have more centrist opinions, right? So irrespective of whether you agree with the stuff that I write 
or, or not. There's a fair amount of work that goes into it, but it's tremendously difficult for someone like me to be taken seriously in politics in Australia. You know, like, um, whereas if you're just some sort of buffoonish centrist who just says the same stuff that everyone else says, then you'll be on Q&A, lickety-split, you'll be on the insiders, you know, stroking your beard and opining about the same ethicism <laughs> as everyone else. So, you know, um, but I think it goes back to, to what I said at, at, at the start, you know, that, that there are other reasons to do this rather than money, that if you have, a, you know, the world is in a terrible spot at the moment. If you have ideas that you, you know, think would make a difference, then you kind of have an obligation to try and argue for them. And, you know, that, that, that's, that's just a basic kind of democratic thing. But, I mean, you've been doing this for 20 years now, and in that time, the kind of shorter, it seems like everything is more personal. How has that changed the way that you write? Yeah, I think that's the case. So when I first started as a columnist in, in, um, in The Guardian, I mean, we were regularly writing opinion pieces of 2,000-plus um, words, which we just don't do now. I think it's like, you know, 900 tops and and part of that was just down to the analytics that everyone has now you know people will tell you that they have a very clear idea of how much people read and at the points at which they um stop reading but i think it's partly to do with recognizing the different outlets that allow you to do different things you know so it's a skill set to write a short punchy political piece and that's a good thing to do in and of itself but there are places where you can write longer more in-depth pieces. you know I, I used to do a lot of stuff for the Sydney Review of Books for instance where they will you know I think I did a 7,000 word piece for them they will give you the space um, to do that it reaches a different audience and it does different um, it does different things um, but there are spaces where you can do that this is almost like an anti-job talk. <laughs> um, I talk about the economics of opinion writing. Is it possible to survive? Look, I mean, I, I was freelancing for a year and a half, not just, I mean, not just as an opinion writer, but just as a, you know, a freelance journalist and writer. So I was writing book reviews, I was writing features, I was writing opinion pieces. You can do it but it's very hard um, it's very hard in Australia because there just aren't that many outlets and you know that was a little while ago and even since then a bunch of the places that I was regularly writing for have ceased to um, have ceased to exist and the difficulty is of course that if you're trying to survive by freelancing like that you have to take almost every gig that's offered to you, so you end up writing pieces that you're not particularly interested in, and often the, the, the content that you come off isn't particularly good, because you have to do it so quickly, and so in a funny kind of way, you can end up with the worst of both worlds, that you write, you don't earn very much money, but you're not producing stuff that's very good. So, so in, that, in that respect, I think in some ways, you are better off um, which I think most people who write a lot of opinion stuff have other jobs. Okay, let's end on a try and end on an <laughs> upbeat note if it's at all possible. I mean, are there some examples or an example, apart from saving your own skin, that you can think <laughs> of where, you know, your opinion writing led to a change in policy or did something? Um, yeah, look, I, I, I'm not... I mean, despite, you know, maybe the impression that I've given, I'm not particularly... Um, negative about this. I think, you know, like if, if you want to um, make a living in writing in Australia, you have to do a variety of different things and there's no one particular job. So, you know, the whole time I've been you know, writing opinion pieces, I've been doing a bunch of other writing adjacent things. And I think, I feel like that's probably the experience of most people now, so that, you know, you'll be doing a certain amount of writing, you'll be doing a certain amount of teaching. You know, I was working radio for a while. So all of those things allow you to um, make a living. And in terms of making a, um, a difference, I, the nice thing about doing this kind of writing is you never really know where the pieces are gonna end up. And, you know, like, obviously you get a lot, a lot of abuse, you know, on social media. 
But at the same time, you get people sending you the nicest emails, the most unexpected people saying, you know, that piece really touched me or, you know, that made an argument I've never heard before. And, you know, that, that's um, about as much as any writer can hope for, I think. Your career has clearly not been a very normal career path. You know, if someone wants to get into writing, the best advice now is probably not to go out and get arrested for breaking various laws. If you were starting off now, knowing what you know, how would you do things differently or what would you do? Yeah, although in all seriousness, I, mean, I think it's worth emphasising there aren't really normal career paths. Like almost everyone you talk to has their own idiosyncratic way that they got into it. So I think the first and the most important thing is deciding that it's what you want to do. You know, like if, if you really want to write, you'll find a way to do it. You know, despite the difficulties of the situation, you might not make a lot of money, you might not, you know, you might not have a, the most stable job in the world, but if you really care about the written word, if you really want to find ways to reach an audience, you will. And I think, you know, the particular ways that that might manifest could well be quite different in the future to how they are now, you know. it's. I mean, it's partly, you know, technology is disrupting the industry, that, you know, the, the various economic crises are disrupting the, 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 the industry, but there will always be people reading words, and if you're someone who cares a lot about them, you'll find a way of making that work. Oh, thank you so much to Jeff. Um, thank you. And thank you to everyone for coming.